chairs up here if anybody up there wants to sit. I'm sure Pete would be fine if you sat on the floor. So if anybody wants to come up here, if you don't mind standing the whole time. Hi, thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Rachel Kaplan and I am the events director at Avid Bookshop. And on behalf of all of us, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you to Pete McCommon. Thank you to Flagpole. This is just a wonderful celebratory event uh, for Athens and we are thrilled to have you all here supporting us, Pete, and 30 years hopefully more, a flagpole. Uh, before we begin, just a few announcements, bear with me. I want to give a huge thank you to Gwen and John of Looney for their generous, gracious sponsorship. I want to uh, say thank you to Amy Kassane and the Athens Clark Heritage <coughs> Foundation, um, as always, for letting us use this space. I think it would be probably impossible to fit all of you in one of our bookshops, so thank you always to them for letting us use this space. Um, we are selling Pete's book. We'll have some copies here and next door. He will sign his books. Um, we might not have time to personalize them all. If you do want to get them personalized, we will have somebody at the ready with sticky notes. Um, because we want to make this go through as fast as possible, so bear with us. Um, and yeah. Alicia Nichols will introduce Pete, but before she does, I would just like to wax poetic about Blackpool for a minute, if you'll let me. Um, reading Flagpole has been part of my daily routine for years now. Uh, from Pete's pub notes to Hillary Brown's grub notes, from Bonita's advice to the always entertaining arguments in the comments sections, I am grateful to our writers, reviewers, and contributors for reporting on Athens happenings and for capturing the unique flavor of our town. Thank you to everyone, past and present, whether you have a byline or if you work behind the scenes. Thank you for documenting and reporting life in the classic city. Happy 30th anniversary and here's to many more. And here is Alicia Nichols. Hey. Hey, I'm Alicia, and I work with Pete at Flagpole. And Pete asked me to introduce him tonight, and it's kind of funny because let's just take a hand. Has, does anybody not know who Pete McCummins is? <laughs> <laughs> kind of an easy job for me, really. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with Pete for about 25 years, but I would bet that a there's probably a lot of people in here who've known him longer than that, so I can only tell you what I know for about 25 years. So um, it's been a pleasure. He's hilarious. Uh, when he was talking about this book, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or more, we're like, yes, this is a great idea. Let's do this. Let's do this. And so then every 12 months or so, we would talk about it again, talk about it again, and talk about it again. And then finally, the 30th anniversary came up, and we're like, well, perfect timing. So. He, I know, was really troubled about which pub notes to put in. There's so many. And the big joke around the office is the new people ask pub notes, well, that's about the bar scene, right? <laughs> so if you read pub notes, you know it's about a little bit of everything. And when he was going through and trying to figure out what to put in there, I'm so happy that the selections he put in were the stories about him and his growing up and his family and his friends because I get to meet with him once a week. We call them management meetings, but half the time they're just us catching up on what we did all week and what happens for the next week. And he tells me stories about his family and about growing up. And he was always like, well, I probably already told you this one, but and I'm like, oh no, no, I haven't heard that one. But I want to hear it again. So, you know, it's also nice to hear uh, somebody pointed out at our, our party the other night, a uh, variety show party about his southern accent. I don't know if you've heard it before, but you'll hear it. Yeah. And um, it's really great to hear it in his voice. So as you read through the book, when you get it taken home, you have to do it in his voice in order to make it work right. So just remember that. But tonight you're going to get the pleasure of actually hearing it. So here you go. Without further ado, Pete McCummins. There are four more seats down here for people who came from Atlanta. Y'all <laughs> come down here. Come on, Richard. Yeah. Bring, bring the kids. Bring the kids. Come on. Come on. Come on, kids. Come on. 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 Come on.
Two more seats here and the catbird seat here. <laughs> Stand up. Come on. Come on. Came from Atlanta, I'm sorry to say. Dave. <laughs> Dave Marr, this is your seat. Peanut <laughs> Gallery, that's, that's my spot. All right. Scott Chicago. Can y'all hear me without the microphone, okay? Or yeah. would it be better with it? With it. With it, okay. I want to be with it. <coughs> All right. Um, I saw a movie once, fortunately a short one, in which the, where the credits started to roll as the action started, and the credits continued to roll, and rolled all the way through the movie. And uh, fortunately, as I say, it was short. But there's so many people that I need to thank that uh, I'll try to make it as, as brief as possible. Um, um, I would like to recognize our friends Chris and Claire Foster and, and Decatur players deathly ill and, and they couldn't make it. It's the only thing that would have kept them from coming. Um, and as far as Felicia's uh, referring to my accent, uh, <laughs> at the flagpole party Wednesday night I read the kudzu piece which some of you sort of know by heart I think. <laughs> but uh, Blake Ogg had to leave to take his wife and child home uh, and he missed my reading and when he came back he was outside and uh, he heard a guy saying damn I thought I had a southern accent <laughs> said, that guy sounds like a reenactor <laughs> so I guess in a way I am reenacting my keynote's call um, so I want to recognize my sister Judy McCommons Boswell and her husband, my brother-in-law, Andrew. Uh, they both taught me a lot about Green County over the years, some of which will be reflected in the book and some of which may not. Uh, and also my sister Jo McCommons Durham uh, had a stroke a couple of years ago and can't come brother, uh, husband Bob. Um, Judy Long, who many years ago was the editor of Hill Freak Press, has been bugging me for years to collect my columns, and when I finally got around to it, she was sort of back and forth between here and Asheville, and uh, uh, Mary O'Brien had also been pushing me to do it. Uh, Mary is an old friend, a member of the Piedmont Gardeners with uh, Gay and a lot of other people here in the room, and uh, Mary is a book editor by trade, by profession, and she finally pushed me into getting started. And of course, as Alicia said, the impetus was the 30th anniversary of Flagpole, and uh, we decided on 30 pub notes, and it's hard to winnow it down, but we did, and uh, we tried to make it an all flagpole. Project. Larry Tenner, our production director at Flagpole, uh, every week designs the paper and the covers and, and everything about Flagpole. And I went to him and I said, Larry, do you think you could design a book? And he said, well, I never have, but I'll give it a try. And so for the next three or four or five months, we struggled with it and Larry consulted his friends who are in publishing and, and uh, he, he just by gosh figured out how to do it and he made a beautiful book which I think you'll agree if you've had time to, to look at one but I, I'm just thrilled with what he's done and uh, I think you'll see the result. Um, of course these columns did not occur in a vacuum they happened at a newspaper and I had the support of our editorial staff who critiqued them every week, who suggested ideas in the back and forth within the newsroom, and our, our ad designer, uh, Anna Vavod, helped keep the paper going while Larry was fiddling with the book. Um, the paper was only possible because of Alicia and the ad reps, Jessica and Anita, uh, who go out every day and sell ads to keep us afloat. And uh, Stephanie, who manages the office, uh, 
Jessica, who not only handles the art scene, but also gets the paper out to 300 locations every week. So it's a, it's a group effort, and Herb Notes is just one part of it. Um, thanks also to, uh, to Ken and Melinda of White Tiger, who put that beautiful spread of food back there. Yes. <laughs> and Gwen and John O'Looney, as tight as John is, <laughs> Praying for the rental of this space tonight. <laughs> and Grady Thrasher and Kathy Prescott uh, arranged for Matt DeGenero to videotape the proceedings. So if you forget what happened, you can perhaps get a copy of it. And, and also thanks to the Avid staff who are so easy to work with. And, have made it so easy to be here tonight. So I'm going to read a few selections. Uh, when I see David begin to nod, I'll... Um, as, as I say in the introduction, it's sort of an uh, accidental autobiography as we began to try to get the number of columns down to 30, uh, Mary O'Brien kept pushing me toward the ones from Green County and, and things like that. And so it, it sort of came up with an autobiographical flavor that I had not anticipated. I thought it would be all about county commission elections. <laughs> sure enough, you know, as we read back through those, they, they are of their time and, and period, and they just don't hold up as well. <laughs> I know you came here expecting me to read one about Nancy Denson. <laughs> I'm sorry, that got cut out. All, all 16 of them did. Um, so anyway, when we look back at, at all the issues... Uh, yes, please. I'm, I'm not a musician. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> How's that in the back? There. You hear? Great. Reminds me about the joke of C.B. DeMille, but I won't tell it now. <laughs> okay, um, this first one is actually the first one in the book. <laughs> Speak to the back of the room. Uh, yeah. Don't be scared of it. I told you I could do better without it. There we go. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Channel your Mick Jagger. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, let me. Know, is it? Okay. First one in the book is about Saddler Matt, um, a man I worked with in, when I was growing up, and he taught me a lot about work. Uh, <clears throat> Saddler Matt was my mentor in Greensboro, Georgia, during the 1950s. Matt was tall, thin, tan, dressed every day except Sunday in khaki pants and shirt, and always wearing a hat, felt or straw, depending upon the season. My first job was helping him dig a grave on a rocky hill behind the Cylon Presbyterian Church in July. Six feet would have been impossible. Three and a half was our goal, but I thought we'd never reach that depth with pickaxe and shovel against that tough red ground. I can see Matt now, his khaki sweated through, swinging the pick and grunting, skeptical of my 14-year-old's ability to hold out at man's work. <laughs> Matt had lots of words for work. That's because he did lots of work. Can you make it? People would ask him by way of salutation. Got to make it, was always <laughs> Matt's reply. And sometimes he added, but it may be way after while. <laughs> Don't let all these tabs worry you. <clears throat> okay, this one is, is about um, going up to a family store with my father after hours occasionally when 
my mother and sisters were out of town. <laughs> my father never cooked anything, and there weren't any restaurants in Greensboro at night at that time. Uh, a couple of roadhouses, but he, he knew how to provide better fare than a greasy cheeseburger. So we would go up to the store, let ourselves in. We pulled off a length of butcher paper and spread it on top of the back counter by the tobacco cutter and the snuff. Then we assembled our feast. Sardines, the better quality brizzlings, vain of sausages, hormel of course, <laughs> perhaps a can of potted meat. We sliced a chunk of cheddar rat cheese from the big round in the cooler, opened a tube of soda crackers, saltines, from a, and cut a lemon and got some pepper for the sardines and some ketchup for the Vienna sausage. <laughs> if it was fresh, we sliced off a piece or two of Brunswager liver sausage from the meat case. Then I went to the drink box and pulled from the ice cold water two six and a half ounce bottles of Coca-Cola, popping the caps in the opener on the side of the box. Spearing sardines and sausages with our pocket knives, we commenced to eat and drink, standing at the counter in the fragrant gloom of the store. Ah, the commingling of taste. <laughs> fish, the sharp cheese, the pungent vainas, the soothing soda crackers, and the peppery Braunschweiger in season, all balanced in their gustatory symphony by the palate cleansing coke. <laughs> New grape or knee-high orange weren't right for that occasion. <laughs> This one was from October 2003. <clears throat> and as I say in the introduction, uh, sometimes when there was not a hot political issue or a mayor to excoriate, uh, I would fall back on some of these that turns out have a longer shelf life. <laughs> So the book is divided into three sections, the, the reflections about Greene County, my growing up, and then a section of eulogies uh, written when people here in Athens passed on. And then uh, the third section is just sort of a grab bag of uh, serious stuff and funny stuff, I hope. But this, this is from a eulogy to Phil Sanderlin, longtime reporter. Uh, at the Athens Observer. <clears throat> Within the too large body, beneath the unkempt hair, the disheveled clothes, the poor grooming, lived a cynical comic genius condemned to observe the follies of humankind in a small arena for low pay and little respect. <laughs> Phil Sandlin was the stuff of the American journalistic tradition of hard drinking, hard-boiled reporters who dispassionately wrote the facts in spite of the, their disdain for the fact-makers. <laughs> <laughs> Yet beneath his slovenly exterior lived a man who unabashedly loved his friends and family, who wept at others' misfortune, and ended every telephone call with a quiet, you take care. Phil Sanderlin was a very private man who lived his life in public. He ate, drank, and socialized in the public houses of Athens. For many years, he, like most of his compatriots, was a regular at T.K. Hardy's saloon at the station. Then Friends Bar in the Georgian Hotel building became his unofficial headquarters. Later, after Friends closed, the Globe was Phil's watering spot. For many years before unification of the city and county governments, Phil had to cover both. Since Friends Bar was located midway, his editors always knew they could find him between City Hall and the courthouse. 
<laughs> this one is from 2001, shortly after Phil died. <clears throat> this one is a, a, a eulogy of sorts to Professor Hugh Kenner, uh, the wonderful old scholar who finished out his career here at the university. And uh, I went to Allen's uh, the, the night before the final concert that they had there, so um, it was full of people there to reminisce, some who had brought their children, and it was just a, and the normal town flyers were playing. And uh, I ran into a kid who told me that, that, uh, that he read James Joyce every day, and it made me start thinking of Dr. Kenner and of my regret at not having had lunch with him at Allen's. <clears throat> so this concludes. The tall old scholar is gone. The generous man who gladly talked and gladly learned and loved his cats and his half wolf dog. The old beer joint is gone. The funky, raunchy scene of all the misspent living that ends up in memories and literature. An older crowd, many accompanied by their sons and daughters that night, filled Allen's with their own memories, wanting to pass them along. Beyond the parking lot, behind Allen's, pricey townhomes rise, where the big kudzu patch used to stretch back toward the dilapidated houses that held a now illegal number of residents, who appreciated Allen's cheap beer and hamburgers. The new neighbors might have been glad to make Allen's trendy, but those old chairs would have torn their pressed jeans. <laughs> Bursat's roadhouses are more the style now, where corporate chains recreate the Allen's look in a safely sanitized decor, providing a bland break on the way home from Walmart. <laughs> we get our history and literature from television, where lesser minds than Dr. Kenner's divine the meaning for us. Allen's will probably be replaced by doctor's offices. <laughs> or Walgreens, and we need not mourn progress. Allen's can't be run as a museum for old beer drinkers who seldom stop by anymore. As the flyers put it, I'm looking forward to living in the past. So farewell to Allen's and to Dr. Kenner. May their urging pass us to misspend time with friends, hanging out in all the right places. <laughs>
was shown by example how life should be lived. We are all richer for her life and we are all poorer for its end. It's 2008. <clears throat> I want to pause just a moment and say that um, as you can see, I did not follow uh, Larry Tenner's advice tonight uh, when I was puzzling over what I should read. Larry suggested that it would be best if I read uh, Richard Fawcett's foreword and uh, Dave Marr's endorsement and, uh, <laughs> and that by Ben Emanuel and Judy Long and Christine Okada who could not be here tonight because she's on uh, Georgia Press business in Savannah. And, and indeed, uh, and then of course uh, Phil Williams who threw away a 19 book career to write the most outrageously over the top cover <laughs> blurb you will ever do. <laughs> Indebted and, and honored by the words of my friends who, who have introduced this book, and you'll see what I mean when you when you read them. They're all eloquent writers. <clears throat> um, this this one is occasioned by a showing that Cine had several years ago, I think as part of the summer film series uh, of To Kill a Mockingbird. And uh, uh, they had, you know, special drinks such as Boo Radley and the Busted Shipper Road. <laughs> and Judy Long appeared in an exact replica of the ham <laughs> that was made by Kate Sawyer of local person who does costume design for movies. <clears throat> but after, the, after that, I got to thinking about just what does To Kill a Mockingbird mean now uh, in the present context. And uh, I'll start reading now. For a long time, we in Georgia, who ran across To Kill a Mockingbird, could see it as a story about a time when things were different here when poverty and ignorance and racial prejudice ruled our land and our people, when black folks were kept in their place up there in the balcony, where they could only watch in admiration when one of them was defended by the tall, eloquent, caring white man in the three-piece seersucker suit. We could enjoy the well-crafted tale, secure in the knowledge that things had changed, that our African-American citizens had come down out of the balcony, had joined hands with the caring white folks and had overcome the snarling hatred of the racist personified in the movie by the character Bob Ewell. Thus, Mockingbird in 2010 is shockingly relevant to where we are today. Our economy is depressed, our society is segregated, most well-to-do white people long ago abandoned public education because they did not want their kids to go to school with black children. And now their representatives in our state legislature are strangling our public schools while allowing generous tax write-offs for private school tuition. Moreover, our representatives in our national legislature are bent on dismantling hard-won protections put in place to buffer our citizens against poverty, disease, and ignorance. Social Security, minimum wage, Medicare, aid to education. Bought by corporate power, our senators and representatives, state and national, turn their backs on the kind of people, white and black, portrayed in To Kill a Mockingbird. Playing upon our ignorance and our helplessness, their corporate backers hire experts to convince us that we do not want or need these protections, and we re-elect them in gratitude. We've gone straight back past 1960 to 1932, and it will soon be as if Franklin D. Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy had never existed. In the present political climate, audiences viewing To Kill a Mockingbird see ourselves as we are today. Atticus Stinch is an out-of-touch liberal. 
Bob Ewell speaks for the, for the majority of Georgians now. They've cleaned up his language a little, and the man we used to see as the mean and sniveling representative of racism and hatred now wears the suit of respectability. His daughter still can't compete academically. His people are still poor. The black folks are back in the balcony. But through people like Bob Ewell, big money has convinced us not to trust the government rather to entrust our well-being to their profits. We still have nothing to fear but fear itself, but well-funded experts know how to whip up that fear and gain power from it. They've pushed the straight shooter Atticus aside. There's nothing between us and the rabbit dogs of corporate control but Bob Ewell's knife, and it's pointed at our heart. I think I get to it. <clears throat> uh, this one is entitled In the Garden. <clears throat> and the subtitle is Behind Every Successful Gardener Stands a Yard Man. <laughs> Gardeners are cold blooded killers. <laughs> That knowledge came as a shock to me. Before I started working as a yard man, I had tended to idealize gardeners. My mother was one after all. Nature is sacred. The woods are my model. The leaves fall from the trees and lie there on the ground, <laughs> slowly turning to compost. Nobody breaks them. A tree falls. And whether anybody hears it or not, it rots slowly and returns to the earth from whence it came. Wildflowers push up untended. Rabbits hop. Snakes slither. Moss grows. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. And no need to go to Kofas to get them some fertilizer. <laughs> No need to transplant an oak from one spot to another. Perhaps that was the scene in the Garden of Eden. Perhaps original sin made gardeners necessary. <laughs> For gardeners, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to dig a hole and a time to dig it in another place. <laughs> a wise man, the father of the gardener I work for, was fond of quoting the saying, a weed is a plant out of place. I have developed a corollary. A plant out of place is a job for the yard man. <laughs> I have heard the lives of roses threatened. If that Don Juan doesn't do something this year, I'm going to pull it up. <laughs> of course, I'm the one who will pull it up. So I try to intercede. Maybe we could try it in a sunnier spot. It's against my nature to kill a plant without giving it a second chance. So I do what I can. Gardeners don't have time for such sentiment. <laughs> they want results. <laughs> Okay, this last one, which is the last one in the book, I'm going to read in full, not just an excerpt. Um, and it's sort of a cheesy rip-off of uh, the movie A Wonderful Life, but that's journalism. <laughs> and the subtitle is, The Columnist Wonders Whether His Writing Has Made Any Difference at All. <clears throat> I was standing on the Mitchell Bridge railing ready to jump into the middle Oconee and end it all. <laughs> 25 years of writing columns about making Athens a better place to live. And what difference has it made? 
Just before I took the plunge, some guy named Clarence walked up. <laughs> Hold on a minute, Pete, he said. How did you know my name, I asked, wondering if he came out of Ben Burton Park. <laughs> I'm your guardian angel, Clarence answered. I turned around to John. You've been given a great gift, Pete. A chance to see what the world would be like without you, Clarence said. What difference do I, did, it, did it make, I asked. You might be surprised, Clarence said. Hold on. The next thing I knew, we were sailing through the air, out over the Atlanta highway. <laughs> Below us, I could see a new Jaguar convertible speeding along, driven by an attractive woman with blonde, curly hair. Who's that? I asked Clarence. That's gay, he said. <laughs> Since you weren't around, she married a doctor. <laughs> never had to know the life of a small town newspaper publisher's wife. <laughs> the second-hand Volvos, the angry readers, the late nights. <laughs> Why aren't we flying over the Atlanta Highway, I asked. I wanted you to see what it would look like if you had never been born, if you had never written all those columns, Clarence said. Looks just the same, I said. <laughs> Small developments, choked with fast traffic, no trees, no place to walk, hodgepodge subdivisions. Hmm, Clarence said, peering down, so it does. <laughs> but look over there toward Prince Avenue. See those vicious drivers trying to run that bicyclist into the curb? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that would be going on today if you hadn't made the mayor promise bike lanes for Prince all those years ago when he first ran by office. <laughs> Clarence, I said, maybe in heaven a promise is a promise. But... <laughs> But look here, he said, turning toward downtown and dropping lower for a closer look. You remember how beautiful downtown was when you first started pushing for historic preservation protection. Here's how it would look with no protection. I see it every day, I said. You'd really know how to hurt a guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at it this way, Clarence said. If you hadn't written all those columns and kept the pressure on, Athens Clark County would be controlled by a few out-of-town banks and the big law firms that work for them and their biggest depositors and a mayor and commission who do anything they want. In other words, Athens would be the most developer-friendly place this side of Oconee County. <laughs> What's more, the whole town would be overrun with luxury student apartments. <laughs> Hostile to poor people and hemmed in by sprawl, with no more green space than a mall parking lot. Then I noticed a beautiful stand of hardwoods stretching out beyond the horizon. Well, at least there would be some beauty left if I had never been born. I said, what's that? Oh, that, Clarence said. That's all the trees that didn't cut, that get cut down to print all those newspapers that didn't cut down. <laughs> Stop, I said, I can't stand any more of this. Get me back to that bridge before the drought makes the water any lower. <laughs> but if I don't save your life, I can't get my wings, he stammered. <coughs> Clarence, I said, this looks like the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> I think you've got the wrong movie, he said. <laughs> and then I woke up. Thank goodness, it was just a nightmare. Merry Christmas. <laughs>